Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on John James Audubon. Uh, I, my name is Melanie Blake, and I'm the director of Classical Pursuits. And I'm doing uh, double duty today, both uh, doing the tech support and uh, facilitating the Q&A and the hosting. Uh, so just last for a little extra patience from everyone. And I'm here today, of course, with Wendy O'Brien, uh, Classical Pursuits and Worldwide Quest leader extraordinaire philosopher, seminar leader, interviewer, all kinds of, all kinds of, Wendy's always up to all kinds of great stuff. Um, today, of course, she will be talking to you about uh, Audubon as part of her three-part Into the Wild series. I know many of you have already registered for uh, the next part on Henri Rousseau, which is next Thursday, October 20. Second, yes, and um, the the rescheduled uh, Lauren Harris uh, webinar on October 28th. Um, so if you haven't registered for those, you can find the information on the Classical Pursuits website or on the World Wide Quest website. And if you do have any questions, just email me or ask in the question panel, and I will do my best to help you out. Uh, we also, as you, as many of you know, we have uh, weekly webinars. So in addition to Wendy's webinar series, we have uh, Sean Forrester coming back. You may remember Sean from our armchair art tours. And he's going to be talking about uh, Japanese art and culture on October 29th. And we have webinars continuing through the fall and winter. So uh, always putting up some new ones keep checking back on our website we're doing a special webinar uh just to note we're doing a special webinar on uh remembrance day with uh scholar bruce meyer this will be about canadian literature of world war one um so we should have information about that up for you soon um that's about it for me i do i do ha i have to do it i'm sorry i have to give a quick plug for uh everything else that's going on at classical pursuits and Worldwide Quest. Uh, so as, some of, as many of you know, Worldwide Quest uh, really is a leader in nature tours in Canada. And if you are interested in nature themed webinars, they have they do have some more coming up and they have a lot of nature um, nature centered trips, both for bird watching and other other um, other trips focused on plants, flowers, animals in Canada for 2021. So please check those out. And in Classical Pursuits, we also have a very full schedule of programs. Uh, we have a lot of seminars this fall, plenty of room in, in, in many of our seminars, and they cover everything from ancient Greece to um, um, to, contem to contemporary literature. So we have we actually have one space left in our Democracy in America seminar, very a very timely topic, um, a seminar on Victorian Christmas stories. Wendy has a new, a new seminar coming out on two novels by the Japanese-British novelist Kazuo Ishiguro. Uh, we'll have, with the first time we've read Ishiguro, I think, at Classical Pursuits, and we'll have more information about that in just uh, by the end of today or maybe the next couple of days. So if you do have, um, if you are in a position to take any of our seminars, we really appreciate it. It helps keep us going through the pandemic. Um, if you have any questions about the seminars or any of our 2021 trips, um, please let me know. You, know. you might be thinking 2021 travel, Melanie, I don't know. But the important thing is, you know, it's true. We don't know when travel will resume, but we're planning and once we can travel safely we will and the, and there's going to be a lot of pent-up demand so the main thing is just to to get your name down with us get your register your interest and um, we'll all move on together and travel again when it's safe um, and that's it from me i'm going to turn it over to wendy and like i said i'll help you out if you have any problems um, i will do my best to get to you in as timely a manner as I can. Wendy, over to you. Thanks, Melanie. And, and I have to extend my thank you uh, and, and an apology uh, to everybody who was planning to be with me last Thursday to talk, uh, to begin this series and talk about Lauren Harris. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> this series is called uh, Into the Wild because I've been really interested in what pulls us 
uh, to wild spaces and, and to wild places. And uh, in order to do some thinking about that and, and to really spend some time uh, thinking and, and putting kind of Audubon, Harris, and Rousseau into practice, uh, we headed off on an adventure uh, into a, a wild place, not this wild place, but it, it, into the uh, Laurentian Mountains, uh, just north of Montreal, uh, to and uh, only to discover that the power grid was being worked on there and we had no electricity. Uh, it was a surprise, it was a bit chilly, I have to say, uh, but we persevered uh, and uh, had a wonderful time, but unfortunately had no uh, electricity. So again, my apologies for that. As I mentioned, the next kind of three seminars or webinars that, that I'll be doing are taking a look at what it is about wild places um, that pulls us to it, that pulls artists to it in particular. You know, what is it that we're seeking in these places and what, what is it that we can actually find? And I think that's an important uh, distinction to draw. Um, I'm particularly interested these days in the difference between what makes for a wild place and what makes for wilderness. And I know we use wild and wilderness interchangeably, but I think there's kind of a fine distinction there. And, and it's one that I think will come up over and over again as we look at, at these various artists. Um, I'm always interested in what you have to say. So please, if you have thoughts about that distinction or, or some of your own experiences uh, in the wild or today uh, with birds, it's gonna be a lot about birds. Uh, we, um, no, please uh, share it in the chat or and post any questions that you might have in the question box that you'll find on, on your uh, GoToWebinar control panel. As I mentioned, we're interested for the next few weeks in thinking about wild places and, and, and the notion of, of wilderness. And well, uh, I hope in our last seminar on Harris to think about you know, what is it that calls us to wild places? What is it that called him to go to extraordinary lengths to travel north, north or north or or north or or or? You'll understand if you join me for Harris uh, on the 28th. But but what was calling him to go to those places and spaces? What what did he think that he was going to find there? But but before we can really think about that question, I, I wanted to talk about you know. What causes us to dream about wild places? And Rousseau and his amazing The Dream uh, gives us an opportunity next week to, to think about our dreams of, of wild places and what it is we think that we'll find there. But, but today, and to get us started, I, I wanted to begin with Audubon because Audubon isn't about, well, any big ideas about what calls us to wild places. And it's not about our dreams of wild places, but his is really a look at the experience of being in wild places. His is really about how it is we, well, I was thinking about this today, and I have to say, for me, what really captured me about his life and about his work is that he had this extraordinary ability to pay attention to the wilderness to pay attention to not just the big things, the beautiful mountain we saw before, but, but to the littlest things, the finest, things, the things that would go normally unobserved. There's something about his ability to be in the wilderness, not to be distracted and not to be drawn away from it, but, but to be there and, and to pay attention that I thought was a, an important place for us to begin as we consider this. What does it mean to live the experience, to be, I guess we talk about it now, to be in the moment? How, how do we capture that? What can we learn from him and his experiences with birds uh, in order to better um, appreciate when we, well, when it's safe again and, and when we can, when we go back to exploring wild places of our own? Um, I have to begin by saying, uh, yeah, birds. Uh, I'm a big fan of birds. I have so many feeders out the backyard and I spend a lot of time. And, and I guess that I've always known about Audubon because if you like birds, y you know Audubon. Uh, he's the great capturer, the 
and I guess the transition between birds as being purely scientific, purely a, a naturalist uh, phenomenon to explore, to being a, a subject matter for art as well. And in saying that, I have to say, I found myself strangely, well, I guess I found a strange kindred spirit in Audubon. And when uh, I was talking with Samantha and Melanie about artists and, and thinkers who would be interesting to do in this series, uh, I have to say, I didn't know that I would find a kindred spirit in Audubon. Because for him, you know, partially he's drawn to the natural world to appreciate it. And partially he's drawn to the artistic world. And I find myself often straddling that divide as well. One foot in both worlds, trying to understand what about the natural world we can capture on the canvas and, and what escapes, you know, what, what we can't grab. But I have to say, when I think of Audubon, this is not the Audubon I normally imagine. No, no, it, it's this that I, I think of more often. I was reading one commentator today and uh, they were saying that, you know, when it comes to Audubon, um, reading his life story is like reading a 19th century novel. And, and it's interesting to think about whether that's because we don't really appreciate uh, the life of those people uh, at that time, that it was way more novelistic than we give it credit for, or, or, or if it's a product of our imagination. Audubon was born in 1785, and he was born in Haiti. He was the illegitimate child of his father and a French uh, chambermaid. And um, his is life of immigrating from place to place, and, and maybe birds have something to do with that. If, if birds move from place to place, so too did Audubon. Uh, he left Haiti uh, in as part of, um, as part of uh, a response to the terror in Nantes. Uh, his family had to flee. They fled to America. And there he really picked up on a project that well, had already started to capture him while in France. His father and, and his father's friends were huge naturalists and hunters. Uh, and he would spend a lot of time looking at birds. He was fascinated right from the start with, with birds. And the story he writes in his memoir, and I will always talk about him writing it in his memoir, uh, is that his interest in birds came from one day when his uh, stepmother was, um, was in her room. And his stepmother loved parrots and had monkeys and all kinds of animals. And, and uh, he watched as a monkey killed a parrot. And he says in that moment, he decided that he would devote as much time as he possibly could to the study of birds. And some people believe that that story is metaphorical. Some people believe it is a total fabrication. Uh, but, but there's something about seeing something, seeing these birds, this bird being killed, that really got him to pay attention uh, to something that we, we tend to overlook, got him to pay attention to a bird that was, you know, therefore pure delight and entertainment and to understand it differently. When I think about, about Audubon and his interest in birds, that's what I think about. I think about you know him, him and that story of the parrot and the monkey and his sudden fascination with the world of birds. He, um, he started to create what will be his kind of masterpiece, the birds of America. He started to be able to fulfill his project of literally uh, drawing a complete work of all the birds in America during his time period. Uh, he started that project really as a result of a, of a tragedy. And as with many things in Audubon's life, we see these incredible contradictions, uh, these incredible kind of paradoxes. Um, originally, when he arrived in America, um, while he had this great idea about um, documenting all the birds that he would encounter that were there, uh, he had to be realistic and practical. He had to get a job. Uh, and so he began um, as a, a partnership in a general store, which was very successful. He didn't work in the store so much as he was out and he was uh, hunting and uh, providing the, the, the meat that would be sold in that store. 
and, and while he was out hunting, give him a chance to spend some time looking at birds as well. But in 1819, there was the general panic that occurred in America, a result of banks over-investing. And uh, he would, as a result of that, become bankrupt. And out of that tragedy really began the, this amazing project of documenting the birds in America. He, he was in 1820 when he actually started off for the first time, started off on, on his adventure of cataloging what he could find, going out into the woods, and really important, seeing the birds in their natural environment. In their, in their habitats. Uh, I have to tell you, this is one of my favorite of his extraordinary drawings uh, that he did that uh, uh, really, to me, captures so much of what he was interested in. You see, he was interested in looking at these birds in, in situ, and he would go out into the forests, and he would you know, take his paints, and he would take his pencils with him, and he would take his journals. And what he would do is, he would document as much as he could there. He would note the plants and note the food and the vegetation and the place and the trees. And his journals are just filled with all this information, this incredible knowledge that he had. And then he would come back and he would try to capture it um, on a canvas, It'd capture it quite literally. We'll talk in a few minutes about how he did that. But, but before we talk about his process, I wanted you to have a chance to actually look at some of the incredible images that he created. He created them, as I mentioned, in situ, capturing the habitat of these particular birds with a, a kind of intimacy, this kind of knowledge of, of them. I kept on thinking about intimacy as I looked at, at these various pictures. I, I like putting these two slides one after the other because it does give you a sense of the detail and his attention to the different habitats. And this was entirely novel when it came to both ornithology and also when it came to artistic representations of birds and art. First, there weren't a lot of birds in art. They were incredibly difficult to, to draw or to paint, small oftentimes and, and quick. You know, it, it was difficult to, for artists to capture them on a canvas. And well, when you did have a chance to see them, they were often captured and stuffed and taken out of context, taken away from the places that they were found in. Um, it wasn't until he actually saw an exhibition at the Philadelphia Museum where um, the curator tried to combine both the place and, and the species that he got this sense that he could do something different on the canvas, that he could capture kind of the world of the bird and I, I like that idea. You know, it wasn't just the bird, but it was, it was the life of the bird. And, and it's funny because he would write, um, to, to accompany his paintings, he would write um, a bird biographies, uh, which are these incredibly detailed accounts of where he found birds and of, of various elements and aspects of their lives. And I often think as I look at his paintings, that there are portraits of the species that he found. And I guess that in part comes from the fact that, well, while he was off on his adventures, as I mentioned, starting in 1820, trying to document all these birds, he was at the same time, uh, simply for cash, uh, doing portraits of individuals and selling them for anywhere from five to $25, depending uh, on the person and the amount of clothing. That's a story for another time, but uh, that they were wearing or not. Uh, it, he was doing these portraits of individuals. And when I often look at these paintings of these birds, I guess it's the individual nature. It's the, the attention to detail, this incredible attention he had that, that gets me to think that these are similarly portraits of, of birds. And he looked at them in ways that hadn't really been documented before. You know, he looked at them in situ and he considered, well, he considered, for example, um, their relationship with their young. Here, this beautiful swan, trumpet uh, swan that we have, uh, something that hadn't been really uh, documented in word or in uh, art before. 
And this is his Eastern Blue uh, Bird painting. And what I love about this particular work is that he's trying to capture it, you know, literally in flight, trying to, to imagine what the bird would be like if we were right there, if, if we could be present with, you know, the vegetation, with the young, and almost as if in motion. Uh, Jonathan Rosen, who's written a great book called The Life of the Skies. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about his work uh, later on in our, in our conversation today. But The Life of the Skies, a, a great book about the history of, of looking at birds, of documenting birds in word and in art. One of the things he says about Audubon is that his works try to resurrect uh, the the individual species he's looking at, the individual bird that he was studying, uh, resurrect them. And, and looking at this bluebird, I, I always get that sense that that's what he was doing. I get a better understanding of his work in that context. Yeah, he, he showed the birds in, in ways that we hadn't seen them both before, combined, uh, trying to show male and female, sometimes getting it right, sometimes getting it wrong. Uh, and he showed them doing things that well, maybe we didn't anticipate. He showed us the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Here's uh, one of his paintings of, of blue jays. And the reason I mention it, the good, the bad, and the ugly in it is the bird at the top there. Let me draw us a little bit closer. You see him raiding eggs. And so it wasn't just a, I guess the birds at my, my theater come to mind in this context. You know, I love to think about them as these lovely, wonderful little creatures that are there for my entertainment. Uh, and oftentimes I forget all the horrible things that they can do, the way they fight and matter at each other, uh, the way they chase each other off. Um, and, and here with the bluebirds, you have that sense too. It, it was the fullness of his observations. I guess that's what I'm trying to point towards through these particular images the fullness of what they ate and how they behaved and what was good and what was bad and what they did in a sense uh, that hadn't been seen literally on the canvas before. Now, I mentioned uh, the detail that goes into it. And as I was thinking about how to really appreciate his incredible observation, I well, I was thinking about my birds again, and, and the sparrows in my backyard. And to really appreciate, I think, Audubon's incredible, not only skill, but his intent, attention, his attention to the little things. Um, a, a little exercise, something different for a webinar today. Uh, what I'd like you to do is, if you have a piece of paper close to hand, uh, if you could grab a pencil, that would be great. And what I'd like to do is ask you to do something that when I took uh, one of my first bird watching courses, I was asked to do this uh, and, and it really made me appreciate A, birds and B, anybody who attempts uh, to capture them in word or in image so much more. Um, what I'd like you to do is I'm gonna show you a picture in just a minute and uh, I'm gonna just show it to you for a couple seconds. And I want you to just take a good look at it. Take a really good look at it. Okay, ready? Here we go. Okay, so that was about 30 seconds. I got uh, you to take a look at that beautiful little sparrow. That's a white threaded sparrow. Uh, and uh, the reason I wanted you to take a look at it and, and to look at it briefly is when you think about a bird, and how it lands and how it flies off. You know, they hardly stand still. Um, well, what I'd like you to do is this. With that piece of paper that you have, uh, or with uh, either in word or in drawing, I'd like you to recount what you saw in that image. You know, just make a list of words perhaps, or if, if you're good at sketching, uh, you know, sketch out what you saw. As I mentioned, I think taking a look at though that image, and then taking a look at what we can see in it and what Audubon saw gives us a kind of new appreciation for the incredible skill that he had. And for his, uh, as I mentioned, his ability to pay attention. So if you could 
just, you know, spend, I'm going to give you another 30 seconds to take a look at those uh, and, and to, I'm sorry, to jot down what you remember that you saw. That would be great. So there's the little sparrow that we were using as our, for our example. And here is Audubon's image of it. I suppose one of the reasons is notice the attention. Notice what he captured that perhaps we don't. What, what did we overlook? Most people get the white throat and the, the dash of yellow, but the intricacies on the wing and the relationship, the size of the body to the tail. And look at the claw that you see most evident on the, uh, on the branch. Look at the details in the claw. He was a great observer of nature and a great observer of nature before photography, before we had images that we could capture like this that allowed us to see in so much detail. It, he was paying such careful attention uh, to the birds that were around him, which leads us to talk about how he actually captured them. Before photography, well, how do you get a bird to stay still long enough in order to be able to paint it in the kind of detail, to draw it in the kind of detail that Audubon did? Well, he did spend a lot of time out in nature. This is a very um, unique uh, work by uh, Audubon because it's one of the few where he puts himself in, into it. Uh, but he would go oftentimes and paint in situ. As I mentioned before, he did these long, he called them ramblings, uh, where he would go out and he would spend you know, months at a time tracing down, uh, tracking down birds and uh, documenting them. Most of the time, well, most of the time, sorry, that's not him. Most of the time we get this picture or, or this image uh, of him. Uh, you may have noticed the gun before and we have a gun again here. Uh, most of the time what he would end up doing is he would end up shooting the uh, bird that he was studying and then bringing it back to uh, wherever he was staying. And well, then he had another problem. He was a really good taxidermist, gotta say, but he had a problem with that kind of taxidermy because it wasn't what he saw in nature. You know, it wasn't the way the bird was moving. It was, I mentioned before, it was out of context and it was often stiffed and it wasn't in motion. So he had to find a new way in order to be able to document the birds the way he wanted to, it, with the kind of detail that he wanted to. And so he would go out on these exhibitions and long periods of time and never knowing whether anybody would ever appreciate them. And the woman, I have to say, uh, that, that I have here, this is Lucy Bakewell. And while he was out on this exp expeditions, uh, trying to capture these birds and trying to create these images and never knowing what would happen, um, she sort of kept the family alive. I have to say, uh, somebody has a great novel to write about Lucy Bakewell, uh, because she kept the family going by um, teaching in plantations and millions of different ways she worked to find money to allow Audubon to continue his project. Audubon would go out on these exhibitions, he would spend a lot of time, he would, he would uh, shoot the birds, and then, then, as I mentioned, he would have a problem about what it is and how it is to capture them. I know it's funny to talk about Audubon and hunting and shooting birds when Audubon has become so synonymous with um, conservation of wildlife. Uh, we'll, we'll get to perhaps that contradiction and, and how maybe, well, he's such a straddler of so many worlds and so many times, it, it maybe it makes sense. But he, what he did was he would kill the birds and he spent a lot of time trying to figure out how best to make them look lifelike so that he could do accurate um, portrayals of them. And, and at first he tried, he tried, you know, the stuffing version and that didn't work. And then he, he tried to take and, and add strings to them, like puppets, 
with some success, but that didn't really work. And then he started to make mannequins uh, of birds, which was a little bit better and it gave him a little bit more dimensionality to it. And then one day he kind of struck on this idea that what he would do is, and I apologize for those of you who are also bird lovers because it's it's not a lovely story, but uh, what he would do was he would kill the bird and then sort of use wires to impale it. And with using wires and a variety of pins, he would put the bird in as lifelike a motion as he had documented in his journals. They capture it just the same way. And he would mount it onto a whiteboard. And he would use either a drawing compass or later on he would put a grid on the whiteboard to allow him to um, get the right dimensions so that the tail would be the right length in relationship to the head, so that all these elements and aspects would be in proportion, and that you would have A, a work of art, but B, also a great work of science uh, that would allow um, naturalists to be able to continue their studies and understand more about the species that he was exploring. It was an incredibly complex uh, process for him to, to capture the birds and then arrange the birds and then to first draw them and then later to paint the, the colors in, uh, and incredibly difficult. And sometimes he used watercolors, sometimes he would use oil, sometimes he, uh, one person has suggested there's the use of pastels, and I'm not so sure about pastels there. And, and he went out on these trips and he did all of this with only one assistant. That's what he was up to and, and that's what he was doing in his studies. And he created, and he carried with him, I'm sorry, all the time, um, La Fontaine's book of fables. And I think that that's important in considering both what he said about those adventures, his ramblings or his experiments out of, uh, out of doors. And also uh, when we look at his, his paintings themselves, he carried the fables with him. And uh, I always think of fables as, you know, one foot in the world of truth and one foot in the world of the imagination. He would paint these images, and most of the time he would go for being as accurate as he possibly could, but sometimes he couldn't help himself, and he would have to embellish a little bit. Definitely true with his images and also with his stories of his adventures as he went in search of these birds. He, he would go and he would paint you know, these extraordinary birds, like the flamingo or the puffin or the eagle with all its various meanings. But he would also go out and paint the ordinary, things like you know, the goldfinch, or for example, the crow. He would be willing to paint, well, uh, birds that, I don't know about you, but I have a hard time loving. This is a starling, and the starlings, if you know anything about them, they're not the easiest birds to love. He would go out and he would see images like this, capture the bird, go back and arrange it and paint these extraordinary uh, works. He would document as a result of that, birds not only abundant in his time, but he actually anticipated to a great extent the extinction of many of these birds. For example, here is uh, a picture of the Carolina parrot. And during this time in America, these birds were captured, A, for food, but also oftentimes to be stuffed in for decoration. And in his journals, he documents watching just, you know, hordes of these come into, um, in, into New York, for example, or into the big city, seeing hunters come in with, you know, wagons full of these dead birds. And I guess that's really where the conservation side came from. Because his journals do recount for us, you know, his worry that if we didn't stop killing en masse and killing for sport or entertainment purposes, that the birds would go extinct. And look at these birds. They're just extraordinary. And again, I like the close-ups of some of his uh, images because you can see the layering of color that was done and the intricacies all on, on the plant that we have here. I think you can see all the tiny little hairs on the burrs 
that surround it. You know, the attention that you have to pay to, to capture those elements or aspects. The same thing was true with his images of the passenger pigeon and also talking about, you know, the, the incredible destruction. Oops, I'm sorry, there's a blurry vision, a pixelized vision. But, you know, the destruction, the mass killings uh, of the passenger pigeon. And, and, and again, anticipated in his journals uh, that they would become distinct. Same too with the I rebuild uh, woodpecker that we see here. I hope you get a sense of what he was doing. And again, I keep thinking about the attention that it takes to capture the details of beaks, to, to capture the details of the trees and the, the bark uh, coming off that, that went into these works. And, and I was thinking back of, about his life. And I was thinking of all the other things he had to worry about. You know, as I mentioned, he would leave Lucy uh, for, for pretty much most of, of two years as he walked across America and documented over 400 different species. You know, he would get these letters from her where she would be worried he would never come back and maybe he had fallen in love with somebody else or maybe he was, where were you and when were you and how were you and, and they had children and how to feed them. I guess his ability to put all those things aside and just look at what was in front of him is what I really admired in a kind of new way after spending uh, quite a lot of time over the last few weeks reading his journals, his bird biographies. If you haven't read them, find a copy uh, or go on the Audubon website where they'll give you the image and the biography uh, together and support the Audubon Society if you can. Um, but the detail, the attention, the time. And I started to wonder if that's one of the things about the wilderness, that it's both what draws us to it and makes it incredibly difficult for us to be there. I was thinking about like, overhearing, you know, as I was uh, out walking over the past week, uh, other hikers and, and their conversations, hearing the tops of their conversations, and how difficult it was for them to be just where they were, just where they are, in the sense that they were always trying to be somewhere else and otherwise. You know, they were always trying in the middle of the forest instead of seeing what was around them. I heard a lot of talks about when I'm home, back at home, I, in the city we, and I can't help but think that Audubon that had to be one of the things that he struggled with in his experiences of the wild as well, to be where he was, to pay attention to what he saw right here and right in front of him. Well, he comes back in 1823-ish, uh, uh, with some debate on that, uh, from his adventures and uh, has this idea that he wants to get his images engraved. But engraving is incredibly expensive at the time. He has this idea that he wants to have these images, number one, done life size. And number two, he wants to have them engraved. And then he wants them correctly colored. Now, color engravement wasn't a possibility at this point in time. So what he needed to do was find somebody willing to create these enormous images, collections of them. They eventually, he would have 435 different species of birds that he uh, documented. Um, he, they had to be done life-size, so these enormous pages that would be created uh, and engraved, and he knew that he wanted good engraving, and at the time that would be acrotaint, copper plates being used, and then they would have to be colored, and it would be, have to be hand-colored or hand-painted. A lot of money. And, He'd been in the woods and Lucy had kept their family afloat by teaching, but man, there wasn't much there. So he gets this brilliant idea, the entrepreneurial or adventuresome spirit uh, of Audubon is something I think to, uh, to be admired. So he gets this idea that what he will do is he'll head off, well, first 
to Liverpool because he knew people who could give him letters of introductions there. He heads off in 1826 with his, with his images, with his portfolio, and he goes off to Liverpool. And when he gets to Liverpool, he has this idea that what he wants to do is he will do subscriptions to his images. He will offer up subscriptions and he will sell the subscriptions. And in order to get people to buy the subscriptions, which will help pay for the engraving, he'll have these shows. He'll have these incredible art shows. Now, well, we've been looking at these images here on the screen, um, but, but we have to imagine them bigger in size. And we have to imagine what it would have been like in 1826 in Liverpool and then in London to see images like this. Now, Liverpool and London were similar in the fact that they were industrialized by the time that uh, Audubon arrives there. Um, London in particular, the industrialization, it was the industrial center. You had the mills going, you had transportation systems developing. Think Dickens, uh, and you'll get a sense of of what the time was like, the factories like were like, the work was like, the lives of people in London, what it would be like. And then you get Audubon, who brings these enormous images of the American wilderness. Um, and, and he's gonna do these exhibitions and these shows and he would charge admission. Uh, one contemporary commentator mentioned that seeing these images would have been like us going to IMAX you know seeing these images all on the wall and he would show about a hundred at a time and then rotate them to get people to come back and see them again and again uh, to see the different kinds of birds could you imagine going from the city and that it kind of in dense dark industrialization in london and going into one of these halls and seeing these birds and i have to say interest in the american wilderness uh, was uh, encouraged or, or stirred up the year before uh, Audubon arrives in London with the publication of The Last of the Mohicans. And, and if you saw that earlier painting of him, you know, that romantic image, he worked it. He worked it. He would come with his moccasins on. He would come and uh, not only have the paintings there, but he would give talks to go along with it in, in order to get people to come and take a look at it. And to get a bit of a sense of what it was like, Here's a, an exhibition. It would have been like this, except bigger. The images were bigger. Here we go. Here's a, a copy, one of the 120 remaining copies of Audubon's uh, original um, engraved version of Birds of America. And, and it doesn't really do it much justice in terms of size. So, so take a look at this picture. This was the size of the images. Now this is a copy and it's being shown here at Sotheby's, uh, a copy recently sold. Uh, Audubon's Birds in America is considered the most expensive uh, book ever sold. It sold for just shy of $12 million. Um, here you get a sense though of the size of the images. Life size was always important to him with all these incredible details involved. And now imagine them on the wall and what that must mean for people who had never been outside of the city, what the call of the wild was for them. I, I, I find them these pictures particularly fascinating. Again, to get a sense of the size of his paintings, the size of the engravements. Here you go, you have a sense of how big. I remember we saw this, and it's a little bit pixelized, but I couldn't find a better image to show you just the size of Audubon's work. Yeah, this is, this is what he was up to and the book was created with such great care i like this version because you can see the quality of the paper and the attention to detail as i mentioned we, there's 120 of these books that remain today most in museums um he never really made a lot of money on the books themselves uh he did eventually find somebody who would engrave them robert Howell, who did use this extraordinary technique called aquatate, where they were hand engraved and then put on cop made into copper plates and used to reproduce it. And then each one of the copies was hand uh, colored. It, it, extraordinary works. It's just, just extraordinary works of art, both the paintings themselves, 
the drawings themselves and then the book that it was created uh, created by it. Uh, it cost approximately, it, estimates was that it cost uh, Audubon about $11,700, equivalent in our time to about $2 million in order to create these books. Never made any money off of it. Wasn't a particularly successful uh, endeavor. But what he did do is when he would go back to America after his time here, he would make a lithographic version of the birds of America. And that would be where he would eventually make his money and, and, and make his millions. It, it's a great story. And, and the story continues onwards. He comes back. His sons pick up the, uh, the artistic skill of his father. He trains them well. They do another book on quadrupeds. Uh, not a complete uh, study, but uh, more books on quadrupeds. He becomes kind of a, a celebrity in the uh, natural world, but also in the artistic world. And there was something about wilderness, you know, that always drew him on. It's amazing. I was reading that when he was 58, um, one of the places in, that he didn't explore, uh, well, he went wide and far and even north. He went to the Canadian uh, north to the province we now call Labrador. Um, he never went to the Rockies. And when he was 58, he had a chance uh, to go there. And he had to remember, right, this is in the 1800s. And he, uh, it, it was rough and rugged travel. And everybody told him that he was too old. And, and he was not as skilled as he once was. His eyes seemed to have problems. And even by the time he left on that trip, early signs of dementia were showing. And, uh, he just couldn't say no. He just couldn't say no. He was so drawn to the wilderness, drawn to the wildlife, drawn to these places and spaces, these species that, that spoke to him in some ways, that, that made him right in the world and right with himself. One of the biographers, and I'd highly suggest you, uh, if you have a chance and an interest, this is um, John James Audubon, The Making of American by uh, Richard Rhodes. And one of the things that he really emphasizes is, you know, he went to nature because there he found these amazing species, but there he also found himself. There he found peace with himself. I, as I can probably tell, I love Audubon's images. I am totally enthralled with, as I said, his attention to detail, what he has to teach us about being in the wild, about paying attention to not just the big things, but to the little things and the importance of those things in understanding the species we're looking at, but also in understanding ourselves and our place in that world. He's fascinating too, as I mentioned before, because of all the kind of paradoxes that he gets caught up in. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, he started off with this kind of naturalistic approach. He, he wanted to go out and study for scientific purposes, uh, the birds around, but then got interested in the artistic elements or aspects of it. Uh, I know somebody will probably ask me about his artistic training. When he was in France and a, a teenager still, he started at uh, a French uh, art academy, but he, he never finished. It, interesting when you look at this image that he never got as far as doing any kind of life studies. He did do studies uh, from classical statues, he tells us. He did do studies from mannequins, but he, he never actually studied anything live. And to think that a guy who never actually had any training in how to capture the live image would create images like this is, is quite remarkable. He had one world in the world of science, one foot in the world of science and one foot in the world of art. He had one foot in the world of hunting and killing species and one foot in the world of preserving species. One foot in the world of the urban, the time he spent in New York, in Boston, in Liverpool, in London, and one foot in the world of the wild. One part of him recognized the abundance of species and another worried about the scarcity of them. Part of him I think was drawn to something bigger and better than himself in nature. 
and part of him was just interested in the stuff of nature itself. And I was thinking about how for many of us, we understand the two-sidedness of Audubon, uh, of his understanding of the wilderness and, and of the wildlife that was there. Many of us understand straddling between some of those same sorts of impulses or understandings of the world. He's a fascinating person and I have to say, I wasn't expecting to find in him as much resonance with our present day experiences of wilderness as I did. I wasn't expecting to find quite so modern a sensibility about how we manage our relationship, how we manage industrialization, how we manage urbanization with wild spaces, as I thought I would when, when I began studying uh, Audubon. Um, I, I thought I would end by uh, this part. And, and please remember, if you have questions, put them in the uh, chat section. And your own thoughts on paying attention, and maybe about some of the distractions that you have, paying attention to wilderness, uh, your thoughts on on looking at birds, please put them in the chat section, or if you have questions, put them uh, under questions. Um, I thought interesting to end um, sort of with one of the last things that he wrote uh, in the introduction to the fifth volume of his ornithological, I have to look at that word. If you've seen me look down every time I try to say it, I always get it wrong. His ornithological biographies of birds uh, published in 1839, um, he included a, a kind of celebration of having completed the publication of Birds in America. And uh, this is what he wrote. Something I think um, interesting for us to think about as uh, people who appreciate nature and art and art in nature. He said, Reader, I would strongly advise you to make up your mind, muster all your spirits, and start in search of the interesting unknown, of which I greatly regret I cannot more go in pursuit, not for want of will, but of vigor and elasticity necessary for so arduous an enterprise. Should you agree to undertake this task and prove fortunate enough to return full of knowledge laden with objects new and rare, be pleased when you publish your work to place my name in the list of subscribers and be assured that I will not leave you in the lurch. He goes on to give us sort of a, a methodology uh, and some suggestions of what we should do if we're lucky enough to find ourselves in a position of being able to look at nature, to experience it the way he did. He goes on and says, now supposing that you're full of ardor and ready to proceed, Allow me to offer you a little advice. Leave nothing to memory, but note down all your observations with ink, not with black lead pencil. And keep in mind that the more particulars you write at the time, the more you will afterwards recollect. Work not at night, but anticipate the morning dawn and never think for an instant about the difficulties of ransacking the woods, the shores, or the barren ground nor be vexed when you have traversed a few hundred miles of country without finding a new species. It may indeed, it may indeed, if not infrequently does happen, that after days or even weeks of fruitless search, one enters a grove or comes upon a pond or forces his way through the tall grass of a prairie and suddenly meets with several objects, all new, all beautiful, perhaps all suited to the plate then how delightful will be your feelings and how marvelous all fatigue will vanish. What a treat. You've been surprised at the length of its tail maybe, or you've taken the practice measurement of all its parts and given a brief description of it. Have you read this twice? Be sure to correct errors supplied um, and supplied deficiencies. Very well. Now you have begun your drawing of this precious bird. Next morning, you find yourself refreshed and reinvigorated, more ardent than ever. 
for success fails not to excite the desire of those who have entered upon the study of nature. That's from The Task is Accomplished, and I'll be sure to uh, send a link to that piece uh, to Melanie. Well, there you go, our first uh, venture into the wilderness with uh, Audubon and an attempt to try to think about how we pay attention to the, uh, the things that we find when we're there, how we experience the wilderness. Thanks very much. Thank you, Wendy. Let me just get my camera back on here. Okay. Thanks so much. I I personally knew very little um, about Audubon, and really, I'm 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 really I'm so keen to learn more. I didn't realize he was such a fascinating person, and and knew nothing about his process. And I'm I want to I want to dig into it. Um, all yeah, right. So let me. I gotta say, uh, his autobiography is is fascinating, uh, but I think his artwork haven't been given the attention that I think they should. And, and I know there's some, some new scholars that are working to spend more time on the art uh, of the birds of America, but uh, yeah, amazing. Very cool. Um, so again, everyone, we're going to have a, a brief Q&A period. Please do send in your questions using the question feature. You can click on the arrow there, or if you're using an, I, an iPad or some other tablet, you can click on the little question mark and that should pop out the question function, you can type your question into the box. Uh, we have lots of thanks coming in, Wendy, from Christina, from Linda. Uh, Linda notes that uh, she had kind of turned away from Audubon because of um, because of his some of his methods, as Wendy had described, of, of killing these birds. But she now says she has a better appreciation of his skill and the perseverance he had to to his calling. Mm. Um, and any, so feel free to comment on that, Wendy, if you like. Yeah, you know what? I found that really hard too. And uh, part of the reason I took up the challenge of uh, looking at Audubon is I did want to spend time like looking at the details and, and his art of attention, paying attention to where he is as a model for what we could do. But yeah, this hesitancy to, to write about a, you know, he's the great conservationist, except he killed all these animals, uh, all these birds in particular that we're looking at today in order to be able to to study them but it was before photography and there was all this interest in the science of it and how did you do that how did you mediate between the need for us to have greater knowledge and yeah it, it, it's a trick it's a tricky one and i have to say um it's been really interesting reading uh, biographies and there's some great ones and we'll be sure to send out a, a biography a bibliography i'm sorry uh, of books that uh, that you might enjoy reading about Audubon and the birds of America, but you know every <laughs> every uh, person who writes an Audubon they get kind of close to taking on this issue and then they skirt the other way. It, it, it's a tricky part that this great conservationist was also a hunter. But I have to say I I never read in his journals the parts that we can read directly or in any of kind of the commentaries and we have so many letters. Um, that he wrote that have been preserved. There was never a sense that he was hunting for the sake of the hunt, but always that it was hunting for the sake of wanting to learn more and being able, like I said, I, I keep using the word document today, and, and I think that's a good one, to, to want to document the species, not just for himself, but also for a broader audience and for the scientific and artistic community. So, I'm trying not to be an apologist for him. It, it's a tricky, it's a tricky balance uh, that we have here, uh, and and Audubon puts us in that position with many elements or aspects of his life. You know, like eh, how do I do it? But then again, too, I start to think about us and and you know our own relationship to, to animals and also to wildlife. I'm grand with at birds at my bird feeder, except for damn starlings because. They come along and I'm out there and I'm screaming, yelling and chasing them off. And I may have been known. I apologize, for, but I'm just being really honest to throw something at them on occasion. And I kind of go, oh, OK. You know, we we kind of sort of like them when they're doing what we want them to do. But when they're doing other things that don't fit our image or our model, 
we got different ideas about well i have to say it's the only time starlings do bring out a kind of murderous streak in me not not a becoming quality melanie but there you go well and you could also think about it you know how much damage do we do to birds or other other animals through through our, our activities through like, yeah. like use of plastic or or lots of other things so uh it's um i i guess i would not be so quick to dismiss myself as as uh or, or sorry to categorize myself as um mm -hmm. having some kind of moral leg up over over audubon yeah, um think about lights and buildings right glass yeah. All yeah. kinds of things. Um, a couple of questions coming in. Um, oh, and I did want. So I did ask people to uh, say what they thought about the uh, the Wendy's exercise. What people noted, and several people noted right away that the sparrow was a bit chubby. Uh, <laughs> I also noticed that right away. Like he had a very rounded body type of bird. Um, Miriam, uh, in response to Wendy's prompt about how do we think about the wilderness. Um, she talks about it as an art gallery filled with endless halls and pathways of unique paintings, objects, and sculptures. Oh, what a beautiful line. Thank you for that. That's a, that's a, that's so beautiful. That's poetic. Thank you. I'll put that in the follow-up. Uh, Jane asks, uh, any thoughts on why Audubon painted larger than life pictures? I think it sometimes had to do with getting a people's attention and to focus on those details that otherwise would have uh, would have been lost. Originally, his works were all life size, and then if you've been to an exhibition, I know there was an exhibition in New York, and there was also one in Chicago uh, just a few years ago. Uh, they do tend to blow them up even larger. The originals, the drawings themselves, were supposed to be life size. Uh, I kind of think, and, and knowing what happened, especially in that time period I talked a little bit about in Liverpool and then in London, I think it really was to give people the experience. People who never had been in the wilderness or never would be or could be in the wilderness, I think he made them bigger than life because he wanted to get their attention and give them something of the magic of seeing these you know, like that flamingo in the color. I, I still marvel at it every time I look at it and go, I need to dress that color. Uh, but, you know, there's there's something about making them bigger than life that was to draw their attention, help them to pay attention, to get something of not just what it looked like, but also something of the spirit of the wilderness. And, and as I mentioned, uh, that comment, uh, I think it was, by by uh, Rhodes, who wrote the book, the biography that I highly recommend on uh, Audubon and the Making of an American. Um, I think he was the one that said it was like an IMAX experience. And if you think about IMAX and what we do, you know, with images, with to get people's attention, um, I, I think that's a good way to explain sometimes why they were larger than life. Thanks very much for your question. Um. And I, well, Wendy, this is a little speculation on my part, but I wonder if some of it had also had to do with, um, you know, we, we think of the Victorian time as um, very, very non-colorful. Uh, but my understanding is a lot of a lot of new dyes and things for clothing were coming yeah. out in the in the middle of the 19th century. And people people were crazy about bright, Color. bright colors. And so maybe they were especially responsive to to some of these colors well when you start to think about what it must have been like to walk into one of his exhibitions and i did mention you know he would change the exhibition he had four different exhibitions he would put up 400 different paintings that he could use right um if you think about what that would have looked like and what it would have felt like in the middle of and i keep thinking dickens this is dickens england for sure like color and the explosions and and what would mean to see something that you could never see yourself? You know, and that's another part of his work that I think, you know, to show people something that they would never on their own be able to go to that place and to see, you know, to bear witness for so many people who could never go to the wilderness 
to give them a sense of that, a feeling for that. I, I, I kind of think that that might have something to do with, you know, the sizes. And, and he was an entrepreneur, right? You have to 11,000, close to 11,700 bucks to get the engravings done. He was hustling during his time in, in uh, London. And, and you know, there's, I, I'm, those fables that he carried, the fables were in part of, you know, a little bit of embellishment about the uh, art and a lot of embellishment about his own life and life story in order to raise the funds he needed to have the book engraved and published. Uh, Janice is asking, um, mm -hmm. how did he capture um, at such a at such a micro level all of the details, such as all of the um, details of a of a feather or um, you know, all the little, I don't know if you would call them fibers or mm -hmm. hairs that would make up all the parts, all the little individual parts that would make up a feather. Yeah, and um, this is just pure observation and pure study. Uh, he went out into the woods, he had one person with him, uh, a student of his, his best apprentice, uh, I think his last name was Mason, if I remember correctly, and this was just a total obsession for him, was to look at every element and every aspect. And, you know, I, I wish we had his um, his paint box and his pencils. And I was looking to see if anybody had them in. Uh, so far, no luck, because I would love to see, you know, the tools that he used in order to create these incredible images, these incredible drawings, as well as the, uh, the image. But it, this is a study and how to pay attention to little things, how to look at a feather. And, you know, we did a, a quick kind of experiment. I wish you were all here with me so I could see what you drew and what you what you noticed about the bird and what, what we miss. Things like the white around the eye. I don't know if you can see in the image we have on the screen. You know, yeah, yeah people always see the shock of yellow in the white throat. And they miss, there's a little, a little circle of white right around the eyebrow that I find fascinating. Um, but, you know, that kind of attention that he spent on on a feather, and I sometimes wonder, to be honest, if we have that ability to pay that kind of attention. A world so full of distractions, where everything moves so quickly, Audubon's skill and Audubon's technique seems almost an impossibility to us. But uh, you know, it, it, a real devotion. And, and it was a devotion, you know, like he always knew that this was exactly what he's going to do. He's 18 years old. Just before he marries Lucy, he figures out this technique of, of using the wires and, and pins to make the, the birds look lifelike. And, uh, and, and then he just says, I'm going to go out and I'm going to walk the entire country and uh, I'm going to record every bird I see. Could you imagine? 18 years old. It's, it's an amazing kind of story. Yeah. Thanks for your question. A uh, couple more questions here before we sign before we sign off. Uh, Jane says, I'm assuming he painted in oil. It's amazing how he achieved so much luminosity in the foliage. Um, and and the, she mentions the clarity of the colors. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, actually, um, they're watercolors. And, and then sometimes he uses like oils on top. He's like a, an early user of mixed media. Uh, so there's watercolors. Most of the, the coloration is with watercolor. And if you look at the details, again, look at the, the wings is um, the person before, I, I apologize, I forgot your name. You look at the details on the wings, right? And you think watercolor? I don't know if you've ever used watercolor or if you have lately, I highly recommend. Actually a strange thing, um, that you can do is there are a lot of great coloring books now I have to tell you I'm not usually a fan of adult coloring books but uh, there are great coloring books for Audubon and we'll put one that I, I really like because it has some some of the history and background of Audubon uh, interspersed with it but take some watercolors or take some watercolor pencils and try to color it the same way and and the particular one I'm thinking of has a color plate on one side and then the blank for you to try to copy it and I'm a big fan of always trying to copy an artist, even if you're horrible at it and I'm the world's worst visual artist. I can see things, but somewhere between here and here, things go really wrong. 
but to try to color it that way, you just gain this huge appreciation for what he's doing. And watercolor is the most unforgiving of all medium. Like you can't fix it. I think the luminosity we see is sometimes that he would use oils on top of some of the images. And again, you know, we're looking at copies of copies of copies and, and sometimes altered for that, uh, that purpose as well. But, but you're right. It's the palette that he uses. It's the level of detail that he has. It, it's the luminosity. I love that word in relationship uh, to what we're seeing. Uh, and, and a medium that is so unforgiving of capturing uh, one of those things, let alone all of them. Thanks, Wendy. Um, we have time for maybe one more question and a quick comment. Yep. Um, some more thanks for coming in. So I thank you everyone for um, for coming to all these uh, all these webinars. Uh, so one comment from Ronnie. Um, mm -hmm. He says, as, as a child, one of the most formative things he did to learn drawing was copying Audubon's, Audubon's birds and how this helped him learn how to see. Um, and he mentions Darwin. Um, he, he says at, at the time he was working, uh, I think, Ronnie, you mean at the time that Audubon was working, Darwin mm -hmm. was putting together his theory of natural selection, which was every bit as detailed as Audubon's paintings. Yeah. So, uh, fascinating time period right because you do you have darwin on the one hand developing his uh theories through his collections uh and observations and and then you have audubon in america and uh what it, there's nothing that i read about the two of them meeting but boy would that have been a an adventure together and thank you ronnie for talking about you know learning to draw from from looking at audubon's because um Lots of us have a lot of time now and always said that, you know, we should try to. And his birds are a great place to start. And also interesting, too, that for many people, birds are their only kind of experiences of, of wildlife these days. You know, many of us have spent a lot of time self-isolating in places where we don't have a lot of access uh, to the natural world. And, and yet there are birds, you know, all around us. and what a great opportunity to spend some time just tr trying to look and trying to look in detail. I love that you said trying to see or see carefully. Uh, these, these little bits of nature that end up, you know, in the skies above us or, or, or on our, you know, front porch at, at points in time. Uh, to that effect, I, I did want to mention a book. It, this is a magical, magical book. It's by uh, Jonathan Rosen, who's a a writer for the New Yorker. It's called The Life of the Skies, Birding at the End of Nature. Uh, and it's a wonderful, wonderful study of um, both writers and also um, visual artists and bird watchers uh, doing exactly, Ronnie, uh, what you're talking about, like learning to look and uh, uh, just the most delightful, distressing sometimes, but a, a really wonderful, wonderful read uh, if you're interested. And, He's got lots of things to say about Audubon. I'll, I'll save it for you. And uh, one final question from Cheryl, who asks about his wife, Lucy. Was she also interested in natural history? Do you know what? I, as I mentioned before, and I had to show the picture of Lucy because I think there is a great story to be written about her. She was um, raised a proper British lady in England and her family um, would emigrate uh, and, and on a plantation right beside um, that of, of Audubon and, and his father. And, uh, and uh, she was known when, when they would eventually move to Kentucky, where they lived for a long period of time, uh, she was known to get up in the morning and go with Audubon. And they would swim a half mile across the Ohio River and back. And I was going, wow, this is a woman in let's say 18, 19, 18, 20, 18, 20, who just goes, okay, I'm gonna swim the river with you. Not the normal kind of version or, or image or idea uh, of a proper British lady who's emigrated uh, to, to what was then the new world, to America. She herself um, was involved. She would, I mentioned before, she keeps the family afloat. She keeps his project afloat. 
She, uh, by, by giving lessons, she, she actually taught music lessons. She didn't seem to have the same artistic skills and she didn't have the same devotion to the natural world, but she always knew that what he was doing was important. And the huge sacrifices that she made um, in order for him to be able to, you know, go to, to London and, and put on these shows and, and to be able to, you know, leave for a few years while I go and, and hunt. And, you know, right up until the very end of, of his life, he would go on these expeditions. And so, you know, uh, I have great admiration for her. I, I, I've been spending all the time sort of thinking about what she must have been like first to, to go to America and then to end up with James uh, John Audubon as her husband. Um, so not, not the same interest and the same skill, but man, she must have been a huge supporter and understanding uh, of the importance of his work to be able to, you know, sacrifice so much for it. Yeah. Often the, it's, it's often the, the backstory, right? Um, yeah. Well, yeah. thanks, every, uh, thanks so much, everybody. We do, uh, a couple people were, a, were asking if, um, about the quote that Wendy read from, so we will put a link to that in the follow-up email. Uh, okay. Again, we'll be back next week with uh, Wendy and Henri Rousseau. Um, if you haven't yet signed up, please um, uh, please do so on the Classical Pursuits website or World, Worldwide Quest website. And if you, uh, I forgot to mention, if you if you did sign up for Lauren Harris, that was supposed to happen last week and is rescheduled, you don't need to sign up again. Uh, we are already signed up. Um, if you have any questions, please about anything mm -hmm. regarding our webinars, you can email me. I'm just going to put my address in the chat real quick in case you don't have it. Mm -hmm. Happy to help you out. And uh, thanks, Wendy. Thanks so much. This. I I really loved learning about Audubon. I I want to try to find try to find some let's try to look at some of these pictures. My my grandfather had some reproductions when I was a kid. I never paid much attention, um, mm -hmm. and I am going to now. Yeah, I I told you, Melanie, the coloring book. It really teaches you a lot to to appreciate it. And, and I just wanted to say thank you all for joining me uh, in in this uh, you know look into the wild and. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, this week we're trying to pay attention to what's in front of us. Next week we'll, we'll talk about the wilderness and how it captures our imagination with Rousseau. I'm really looking forward to it and so appreciative of all of you attending. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. Um, and I just realized I am not sure how to stop the webinar. Uh, <laughs> Samantha usually does this for me, so um, give me one second. And um, But thanks, everyone. See you next week. Goodbye. Bye. Okay, so let me uh, let's see here. Oh. <laughs> okay, I got it. Okay, thanks everyone. <laughs> see you later. <laughs>